flip over to the second chapter. We've now finally made it to the second chapter of of the book of First Peter, and uh, Dad asked me yesterday, he said, "How far are you going to get?" And I gave him the most honest answer I could give him. I don't know. Um, really, I think we we'll, we will make it through um, verses one through ten. Uh, in this second chapter tonight, but uh, uh, I don't want to rush through this great book um, because there is so much vital information uh, that that we have in in First Peter, and and I just I want to make sure that we're able to to get all of it. When I ask you, or if I was to ask you this question, what does it mean? to be spiritually mature? Somebody answer for me. Okay. All right. Totally controlled by the Spirit and relying on Him. All right. What else? All right. To live like you've already been raptured. That's good. What else? The question. <laughs> I forgot the question. The question is, what does it mean to be spiritually mature? Okay. Having a confidence in Christ. All right. I heard two. Tell me. To be more like Jesus, all right? Well, okay, good. Okay. We, we talk all the time about the fact that you and I as Christians are, are, are to move from an infant state and that God has called us to spiritual maturity. And as I, got, as I was going through this passage of Scripture and I was going through and, and thinking and praying over this, the question that kept hitting my mind was, what does that mean? And then there's a second question that I want to ask you, and so this will be interesting for me. How many of you would consider yourself to be spiritually mature? Oh, good answer. She said, I don't think we ever get reach that point. Well, all right, let me ask it another way. How many of you would say that you were more spiritually mature today than you were the day you gave your life to Christ? All right, now we're getting some, we're getting there. All right, what about this? How many of you are more spiritually mature today than say you were Sunday? All right. What about yesterday? Yeah, you know, we sit and we think. God has called us on a daily, lifelong journey to grow in Him. When I ask the question, what is spiritual maturity? The truth is, that's kind of hard to answer. In fact, he, he answers it in a way in this passage of Scripture tonight to where we realize and understand that we are not going to get there. Because to be spiritually mature is to be like Christ. Now, I don't know about you, but I put a gauge on my life just today, and I'm not there yet, okay? So then I begin to ask other questions. I begin to ask the questions like, are you more spiritually mature than you were when you gave your life to Christ? Most of you said you were, and, I, and, I, and I'm glad of that. Do you know that there's a lot of people that, that the spiritual pinnacle of their life is when they gave their life to Christ? Now, here's what I mean by that. The day that they gave their life to Christ, that, that is the most excited, the most uh, that they've ever been in their walk with the Lord, and then it just kind of stalemates from there. You know, there's a lot of people that trust Christ, but if they don't get connected, and when I say connected, I'm not just talking about connected to a church. I think it's important. I think it's biblical. But I'm talking about connected in a journey to grow. Connected in a journey to, 
to daily, what Paul said in Philippians 3, to daily forget what's behind and strain toward what is ahead and pressing on toward the goal for which God has called us everywhere. And so that's why I said this, this spiritual maturity that the Bible talks about, that you and I are to grow, it is a growth process. We start as infants. We end in heaven, basically, because it never stops. You never get to hop off the spiritual growth train. You never get to say, I have arrived. There's never a point in time when you can say, I, I had somebody one time, uh, no lie, um, that I was encouraging them that they needed to be involved in Sunday school. And they said, this is what they said, they said, well, I read through the Bible all the way through one time. It surprised you if I told you who that was, too, but I won't. Just because you've read through the Bible, uh, here's the thing that I've learned. I've preached and I've taught through 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 10 before. And tonight is going to be a completely different sermon, a completely different. Why? Because as I read and I studied over the past week or so, getting ready for tonight, God brought some new things out in this. And so what that told me was, oh, I hadn't got there yet. You know, I, I haven't arrived yet. And neither, none of us have. I want to invite you, as we, write, as we go through these ten verses, I want to invite you on a journey. On a journey of what, what this really tells us is five steps from what I will call either infancy or self all the way to spiritual maturity. And I want you to see this, this journey. There's five steps here that Peter talks about, obviously through the inspiration of God, that Peter talks about in these verses are of areas for you and I to gauge in our life to see how we're doing. And so, I just want us to walk through these things. Let's, let's look at this passage of Scripture. First of all, let's just read it. This is uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. It says this, Therefore, rid yourself of malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. Now that you have tested uh, excuse me, tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Verse 6, for the scripture... For in Scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious, but to those who do not believe, the stone the builder rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stone that caused people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. Verse 9, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now it says you have received mercy. All right, well, let's look at this. I'll be the first to admit, that's why when Dad asked me, I was like, I'm not sure how far we're going to get. Um, there's a lot of information in these 10 verses right here. There's a lot of information for you and I to be able to put into our lives and ask the honest question, are we on a journey of spiritual growth? Well, I pray that uh, wherever you're at right now, that you will begin this process and allow God to begin this process in your life uh, to spiritual maturity. So let's start this process. It starts as we would call infancy. It starts be, as being spiritually 
infants. That happens when you trust Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Uh, That's why I told you a minute ago, if that's the pinnacle of your relationship with Christ, you've missed what God has for you. you. We trust Christ, but then we don't grow any further than that. That's not what God teaches us. And so the first thing it tells us we have to do as infants in Christ is to strip away the old self. Look at verse 1 again. It says, therefore, rid yourself of all malice, all deceit, all hypocrisy, all envy, and slander, it says, of every kind. This word, rid yourself, it literally means to put away and never pick up again. I have a major problem at times where I'll put something aside, but then I'll find myself going back to it. I think we all probably have those areas in our life. I've had things in my life where I put aside for weeks. I've had things I put aside for for months. I've had things I put aside, but something inside of self, something draws me back into that. And so we go back to these things. But when it says to put off these things, it literally says, and, and what we like to talk about is putting off self. When you trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, think back to that moment. Some of you, it hasn't been long ago. Some of you, it's been a long, 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 long time ago. But that day that you gave your life to Christ, there there became a battle because you had you, self. Self wanted to serve self. Self wanted to live for yourself. And then all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit moves into your life. And so there becomes this battle that takes place. Well, this passage of Scripture says the journey that you and I must start with in growing spiritually is to rid ourselves of what I would simply call self. To rid ourselves of the things. And it lists several of them in here. It says, uh, therefore, rid yourselves of all malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, slander of every kind. Now, I want you to think about that. I don't know how you would fully define every one of these things. I don't think you could pinpoint them in just one area. I think those are pretty broad areas. Um, I'll just use one of them as an example. This word, hypocrisy. Well, this passage of Scripture says for you and I to begin this journey of spiritual growth, we have to rid ourselves of hypocrisy. What is that? Well, here's what it is. You have to rid yourself of anything that is contrary to what God's word teaches you and contrary to the Savior for with which you serve. Well, that's, a, that's, a, that's tough. I don't know about you, but I find myself getting in the way a lot. I find myself getting in the way of what I know. And do you, you know what I'm talking about. You know what Paul said it in, in, in uh, Romans chapter 7. The Apostle Paul is writing, and he says these things. He says, and I think it speaks exactly to what this is. Paul says, all the things that I know I'm supposed to do, all the things that God calls me to do, all the things that I claim I'm supposed to be, I never get those things done. He said, but then he goes to the other side. He says, but all of those things that I know I'm not supposed to have in my life, all the things I know that I'm supposed to, as Peter would have said here, rid myself of, all of those things that I was supposed to have put away, Paul said, I find myself entertaining them every single day of my life. I don't know about you, but I are that person. That is me. And Paul goes on and he says, Oh, what a poor, wretched soul I am. That's the Apostle Paul talking about his life. Outside of Jesus, Paul is probably the greatest missionary that has ever walked on the face of this earth. And he struggles with this first part of this, of getting rid of hypocrisy, of getting rid of envy, of getting rid of strife, of getting rid of malice. Malice is anything of, of an anger side. Uh, anything that, uh, it's, it's getting, at, uh, getting away and stripping away everything that takes your eyes 
off of Christ. Now, can I remind you of something? That, it says, is the beginning of our spiritual journey. You say, well, that's tough. It is. I've been discipling a guy, um, helping him, um, brand new Christian. And uh, um, he had areas in his life that were um, just, you, you can tell, he's a brand new Christian. And uh, so I was, we were, we were sharing together one time, okay? And we were just talking, we were talking about getting this journey going. And in his talking, he, he used language that we ought not to be using, especially in front of the preacher. And he just went right on by. It didn't, he, it didn't phase him. Later on in the conversation, we're talking a little bit more, and he used this word again. I looked at him. Third time in the conversation, he used that word again, and I said, you're going to have to stop that. He said, I don't even think about it. I said, I know. I said, that's why I let you go. For, I said, I gave you the first two. I gave you two mulligans on this one. The next week we got back together. We were, we were talking about spiritual things. And he was talking. One of those words came out. And he went, oh, pastor, I'm so sorry. I'm very sorry about that. I said, well, that's good. Third week, we were talking. Not one ugly word came out of his mouth. And I, at the end of our time together, I said, I want you to notice something. I said, week one, you said these things and didn't think about it. Week two, you said one, but thought about it and backed up. Week three, you didn't say any. He said, I thought one, but I didn't say it. I'm not. He did say that. He said, I thought one, but I, I didn't say it. But, but what I told him was, I said, what you're seeing is a slow process of getting rid of this stuff. What used to be old nature to him and habit to him, now he had a check. Now the Holy Spirit was going, ah. Before he just did it. Then he would do it and the Holy Spirit would be, don't do that. And then he finally got to this point where the Holy Spirit was, was, was speaking, and he said, I'm not going to do this. You see the process it goes? For you and I, that's, that's the starting point. Strip away the old self. Number two, this is verses two and three. Grow daily in Christ. And there's a couple of words in verses two and three that jumped out at me. And I want to I share them with you, okay? He says, like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. Now that you have tasted, it said that the Lord is good. The word that jumped out at me this time was that word crave. I got to thinking about that. It says, like newborn babies crave spiritual milk if some of you may be like me I don't know I in 46 years I think I have spent at least 45 and a half of them on some type of a diet I have been on every diet that there ever was I'll never forget one time I was younger and Mom said, I found, you a, I found a good diet. I want you to try this. And I tried. The diet meant that I had to eat cottage cheese. I didn't stay on that diet. I'll never forget there was another diet one time. If you'll just eat four grapefruits a day, I figured out why. You go eat four grapefruits, it'll mess you up. It was horrible. But I've been on these... But when I get into these diets, I begin to crave. You ever had that craving? You ever drive past Krispy Kreme and that red sign is just blinking? It's from the devil. It is. And my car just turns in there. Why? Because I crave it. I'd be like, well, I'm not no carbon today. 
When you crave something, you'll do anything in the world to go after it. When you crave something, you just, you've just got to have that. I, I used to get tickled. They used to talk about women when they uh, were, were pregnant with, uh, with babies, and they have all these weird cravings. I'll never forget when Beth was pregnant with Megan. Um, we, I mean, it's late one night, and to those of you that know me, I don't do late night stuff anyway. But Beth said to me, I, I need juice. I said, you got to be more specific. She said, no, I just need juice. We're going to ride, it was Winn-Dixie at the time, we're going to ride to Winn-Dixie and you got to get me juice. I pulled up at Winn-Dixie, I went in. Y'all, I bought probably 20 bottles of juice, every flavor you could imagine. I came out with bags like this. And if I, and, and you can ask her sometime. I don't think she'll mind me sharing with this. I put those things in the floorboard, and my little dainty, precious wife reaches down and grabs a jug of something and in the car just turns that thing up. And she don't do that. Why? She craved it. This says that we've got to, to crave growing in Christ. What does that mean? You've got to crave reading God's word. You've got to crave that prayer time. You've got to long for it. So many times people, and, I, I, and I'm not even going to ask, I know we all started or most of us started the journey of reading through the Bible this year, and I have no doubt some of us have already fallen off. Okay, I know that. And maybe not. Maybe not in here. But I've already talked to people who have like they've called me and they've said, ah, "Can I? How can I get back?" I said, "You're going to have to read a bunch of chapters today <laughs> to get back on this." But we do. We fall off. Why? Uh, you know, it, it was a great to, it, for the first few weeks, and then we just kind of fall off with it. I've had people say, "I have a str- I struggle." with my prayer life and I said well what happens and they say well I, every time I start to pray I just nod off and I go to sleep you know why because we're not in love with God like we're supposed to be when I was dating Beth here's the thing I never once nodded off talking on the phone with my uh, my fiance at the time you know why because I was in love with her We've got to crave this. They say it takes 21 days to build a habit, and, and, that's, and I hope that you've read at least the 20 through 21 days and you've gotten into the habit of doing that. But I've heard people say all the time, well, why do you go to church? Well, it's just a habit. It's just what we've done. Why do you do? Well, it's just a habit. We, we say our prayers at this time. Well, why do you? Well, it's just a habit. And, here, and, and, I, and I, listen, if that's the only thing keeping you in this, you just keep that habit. But here's what this says. This says that we, like newborn babies, it says we've got to crave this spiritual milk. We've got to crave this stuff. And so, so we've got to grow every single day. And we've got to crave after it. We've got to long for it. We've got to fall in love with God like he fall, he's fallen in love with us. Number three. This is a tough one. Verses four and five. Present, present yourself as a pure living sacrifice before God every single day. Look at this. Look at four and five. It says, as you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to him. And look at verse 5. You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices accepted to God through Jesus Christ. Can I tell you one of the most important parts of verse 5 there? is this idea that you are being built into this spiritual house. Because did you notice what it said you were? It said that you were living stones. You can't build a house with one stone. You take a stone, and then a stone, and then a stone, and then a stone, and then you build them up. 
And, and I want you to understand that through this journey, as you present yourself to God as this living sacrifice, it says, I want you to understand that every day that God is adding to that a stone of spiritual maturity. And it says that he's taking these living stones that you're bringing before him, and he's building you into, it says, a spiritual house. Well, what does that mean? Well, that means, like we've said, this is a daily this is a minute-by-minute minute journey. I used to say it was a daily journey until I look back over my day and I realize, oh, I messed up a bunch of times. It's got to be constantly what is in our mind. That's why God's Word says that we bring every thought to the obedience of Christ. Every, think about that. Every thought to the obedience of Christ. Spiritual growth is not easy, but it's what God called us to do. Number four, maintain your foundation in Christ. Look at verses six through eight. He says, for in scripture it says, see, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now that you who believe, um, now to you who believe, this stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone the builder rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone that caused people to stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. We've got to make sure that our foundation is set in Christ. If you ever built anything, you realize that the most important part of building a house is always the foundation. If the foundation is bad, the house is not going to stand. Jesus even gave a parable on that. You know, the foolish man, we used to sing a song with it, but the foolish man built his house upon the sand. And the rains came and the floods came up and the sand began to shift and the house fell. Then it said there was the wise builder who came and he built his house upon the rock. And the rains came and the floods came, but the house stood still. Why? Because it, was, it had a firm foundation. There's so much in that parable that we could talk about, but there's one thing I want to draw you to. I want you to notice the house built on the sand and the house built on the rock had the exact same storms come through. The one that was on the sand had storms and the waters rose. The one that was on the rock had storms and the waters rose. Only one of them could stand. Why? Because of the foundation that it was on. I'm telling you, folks, in our spiritual journey, we must make sure that our firm foundation is in Christ. And here's what happens when everything else falls away. You know that he never will. I'm, I'm gonna, I'll give you a prelude to what some of my, my uh, past few days have been. I went this morning and I... Uh, was with Jerry and Sybil again. Yesterday I was there and uh, Jerry was awake and we were talking and, and everything. Today he wasn't. And I got there today and Sybil was talking to me and she was asking me to prepare for something that I don't want to prepare for. She was asking me to prepare for Jerry's funeral. But the passage of scripture that she asked me to use blows my mind. And I'm going to give it to you. First of all, don't look it up, but it's Psalm 118.24. You'll know it when I say it. They've been together 59 years. When they were married less than a week, Jerry got his draft papers. They lived in several places over in Georgia. He ended up down right on the Rio Grande when they had Tommy. They had a lady that would cross the Rio Grande from Mexico every single day to take care of Tommy. They lived off of $150 a month. They grew together. They loved together. They shared together. 
She told me story after story after story of their life. She told me, she said, if Jerry Lewis doesn't pick at you, he probably don't like you. And I said, he must love me. <laughs> one of the last things he said to me, this was not, not the last thing he said, but one of the last times that I went and saw him, I walked in the door and he said, who let you in? I just knew that was Jerry. Last night, they, they made the decision that they, they were not going to do any more of the medications, anything. He's, Jerry hasn't eaten or, or drunk anything in quite some time. And uh, when I was there yesterday, I saw a huge noticeable difference. When I got there this morning, um, major difference. And she's talking to me about all these things in her life, and she says, but then she, then she sends this word, that she, this is the, the verse that she wants me to use. This is the day that the Lord has made, and I will rejoice and be glad in it. Can I tell you something? You can't go through everything that they're going through right now and say, this is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it if you are not standing on the rock of Christ. There's no way. You can't. I promise you, it doesn't matter what storm you've got going through in your life. Make sure your foundation is in Christ. I told, I've, I've told you some of this story before, but I had a guy that had ruined his life. When I say ruined his life, his life as you and I would know what he ruined. He ruined his family. He lost his wife. His kids hated him. He lost his job because of, of things he had going on in his life. And he came to me so broken. And this is what he said. He was squalling his eyes out. And he said, I have nothing left. And I looked at him and I said, you still Jesus. A firm foundation. And you better maintain that foundation. Because I want to tell you something. You don't know what storms are going to come that are going to rock you. You don't know what waters are going to rise that are going to be so shifty under your feet. You don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. One week ago today, we buried a 15-year-old. You don't know what's going to happen. But I can tell you this. In Christ, this is the day the Lord has made. And I'll rejoice and be glad in it. What Sybil basically said to me today was this. My circumstances do not dictate my Savior. Praise God. 9 and 10. we got to close with this. 9 and 10 is what I just simply wrote on here. Spiritual maturity. This is the journey. This is where we lead to. We strip away our old self. We grow daily in Christ. We present ourselves to God as a pure and holy and living sacrifice. We maintain that foundation that we have in Christ. In verses 9 and 10, Give us what it means to be spiritually mature. And I want you to hear it. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Listen to this. God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. It says once you were not a people, but now... You are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now it said you have received mercy. Can I tell you, and, and we'll close with this. When you're going through whatever that this life throws at you, and you maintain this foundation that you have in Christ, 
what God will do is take all these trials, all of these troubles, and they'll turn them into, he'll turn them into a testimony for you in your life so that you can look back on them and you can say, I know that my Redeemer lives and I will stand with him on that day. Y'all remember who said those words? That'd be Job. Everything in his whole life stripped away from him. And he said, I know my Redeemer lives and I'll stand with him on that day. Spiritual growth is vital. We're all on a journey. I will admit, there are numbers of you in here who are much further along in your spiritual growth and your development than I am. There are some of you in here that are more spiritual mature than I will ever be. And I, and I say that dishonestly. But that don't mean that you and I haven't been called to daily grow in this. Cast off that self. You know what bothers me? Is I found myself on this spiritual journey and I will, I will be further up here than, than probably than I really, uh, or, or I'll be not quite as far as I think I am. And I'll have to go all the way back to step number one because self just starts sticking his head back up. That's why scripture says, if any man should come after me, let him first deny himself. And you take up your cross and you follow me. We like this idea of following Christ. We don't like this idea of denying ourselves. Spiritual growth is a journey. It's a journey that you've been called to. It's a journey that I've been called to. And so I'll go all the way back to the questions that we had at the beginning. We don't define necessarily what spiritual uh, maturity is. I'll just give you a basic reader's digest of what it is. Spiritual maturity is when you and I become like Christ. We're not going to get there. Till one day we stand before him in all of our sin. We don't have to struggle with any of those things anymore. So in that process, in that process, we defined what spiritual maturity was. And so here's the last thing that I want to ask you. In your spiritual walk, are you more spiritually mature right now than you were this morning? Tomorrow, will you take the challenge to grow spiritually even more than you have today? And the next day, you say, well, my Bible reading is in this. Or somebody called me yesterday and said, I'm in Leviticus. What do I do with all this? I said, don't do that stuff. Don't do that stuff. I'm with you. Listen, I know. They said, we get in the middle of all these begats, and I don't know what to beget. I said, just, just read them. Grow, 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 grow. And as you do, you will become more like Christ, which is what he's called us to do. Anybody got any questions or comments? I told you we'd make it through 10 verses. All right, I love you. I really do. Um, proud to be your pastor. Proud to be your friend. Um, we're going to get out of here. We're going to come back Sunday. I am the resurrection and the life. I'm looking forward to Sunday sermon. Let's close. God, we love you so much. And Lord, I thank you that we're all on this journey growing together. And Lord, I just pray, Lord, there's going to be so many things that are going to try to get in our way, so many stumbling blocks that are going to get in front of us. But God, I pray that we will cast off self and we will serve you with everything we have. That we will grow daily in you. Lord, that we will be able to present ourselves as a, as a living sacrifice before you. Lord, I pray that you will. Lord, that you will take these living stones of our lives and turn them into a spiritual house. And Lord, I pray. I pray that our foundation will always be in you Lord everything in this world may strip away but you never will so God we love you keep us safe as we go home tonight 
give us a good night's rest. Lord, bring us back Sunday as we worship together. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You're dismissed.